Let's just jump in the deep end. What is money? <laughs> like the most convenient and beautiful lie we could ever tell each other. That, that's how I would phrase it. <laughs> it's not a cliche. It's a deep reality. Money is the highest form of power, the superset of all power. To me, money in itself is is worthless. It's what money buys us, whether it's the experiences. For some people, it buys them status and power over other people. Money is liquid fitness. Because it's both the physical technology and the psycho technology. And you know, money is just one of those things where people don't talk about it really all that much. And, and the money, whether it's Bitcoin, gold, or silver, is just a way to store your excess productivity. Asking the question, how does money work? What is money? Right? right. the name of your show. Yeah. That is the single most important question in the world today. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the world's first startup accelerator program focused exclusively on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what is possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to Wolf nyc.com today to apply for the program or learn more. Again, that is wolfnyc.com. I know we're going to get complicated and in the weeds and all that, but I want to start very simply, actually, which this, you know, the namesake of this show, What is Money? I've named it that to try and encourage people to be more inquisitive and curious about the fundamental nature of money. And to satisfy my own curiosity, I would like to ask you, uh, a mind that I respect a great deal. That question, what is money? Well, before I, I think that's a terrific place to start because, you know, in the 21st century, especially as we move farther and further away from actual money, physical commodity money, and get into heading towards what I hope is, you know, a more digital future. It's a question I don't think many people answer or even think to themselves about. It's just, I got a couple pieces of paper in my pocket that have stamped on it something from the government. That's money. Um, I go to the grocery store. I tap my phone or, you know, I tap my credit card to the machine. I don't know what money is. It's something happens and I walk out of the grocery store with some goods. And we, I don't think enough people really stop and think about what it actually is. Mm -hmm. And what it is not is money is not wealth. And that's another thing I think we get, mm -hmm. we get hung up on, too, is that we talk about people who have money. They must be you must be wealthy. And that's, that's, that's true in a sense, but that's not really what money's purpose is. You know, we talk about the three, the three, uh, the three main functions of money, which are store value is one, but I think the other two functions are more important, which are medium of exchange as well as unit of account. And when you think about them, especially those two functions, what you're really talking about is money is a tool. 
it's a tool of, of a very spe you know, highly specialized modern economy uses to conduct commerce most efficiently, flexibly, and, and, and uh, intuitively as possible. Hmm. So in a really basic level, money is supposed to be secondary to the real economy, and it's a tool that allows the real economy, commerce in the real economy, to take place because it intermediates. Hmm. It intermediates between competing interests. And as we're going to see with the euro dollar system, it intermediates between often very different systems. So that's hmm. how it is a tool. But let's we always got to keep in mind, money isn't wealth, it's a tool. When you look at it from that perspective, then I think some of these other things start to fall into line about you know, how far we've gone from <laughs> right, right. You know, what they're supposed to be doing. The cliche, money is power, right? Money yeah. is power. It's not a cliche. It's a deep reality. Money is the highest form of power, the superset of all power. Every kinetic energy, I can take bows and arrows and guns, club you to death and take your money or take your value. With a war, I can convert kinetic energy into power, atomic energy into power, chemical energy, I can burn and create power, right? Gravitational energy, I can dam a river and create right. power. And ultimately, that power becomes money. So, but I can't do the, maybe I can do the, I can take the money and I convert it back in the other things. But, but yeah. money is this amalgam of all powers you know, that, that mankind has managed to collect. Money is a concept and it's a concept for our time. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's yep. just a concept. It's an agreed upon concept for our time and we trade our time for money. So it's worth what we think it is worth in, in that. So money itself has no value today. It's a piece of paper. Yeah. Um, to, it, it, the only value is when it's moved into something you want. It's a medium of exchange, or it's a right. It's something that you trade your time with, and you store your time. You store your time, yeah, in something that you don't want to lose your time. When you destroy uh, money, you're destroying our time. And so it's really simple to see why is everybody on a mouse wheel working more and more in an abstract? where well, they don't know what's going on. They can't put their finger on what's going on. They just know it's getting harder and harder for me to keep up on one side of that equation, right? Yep. If you're on the bottom side of that middle class and below, <laughs> harder and harder for me to keep up. Well, I'm equally scared about my job being outsourced away or, or automated away. Yep. It's hard. So that it breeds a whole bunch of fear and more fear because it's true. Technology is going to do that. Yep. And on the other side of that coin, the people that are getting enriched by it are going, wow, love life's good. This yep. is really great. And so their, their time is expanding by, by that same, uh, uh, same nature of hurting the value of money or destroying the uh, value of money. And you can see as a consequence, everything else, but it's uh, to me, money in itself is, is worthless. It's what money buys us, whether it's the experiences or what our perceived experiences, or for some people it buys them status and power over other people. For yeah. some people, uh, it, 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 um, it, 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 but it's the things that it buys you or the things that you want to be known for or your experiences or anything else. That's what all money to me, all money is. I, I never thought of it that way that the middle and lower class you could say is getting attacked from both sides and the quantitative easing is, is, is widening the disparity between rich and poor. So they're getting pushed lower down, but then they're also facing job loss by technological disruption. So they're getting squeezed cool. out. But all of these, at least on a fiat currency standard, most of this gain or productivity surplus, economic surplus is accruing to the top, to assets. Yeah. 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 So the, in, in that world, your time is expanding. And so this leads, that's why it's such a dystopian outcome, right? It leads to where one group of people hold all the time. Yeah, exactly. My view has, I think it's evolved. I mean, I've grown up in a fiscally responsible family, yeah. right? So my parents, I don't remember, I think my parents really taught us much directly about mm -hmm. money, but implicitly I learned number one, that money is valuable and that money is something you work for. 
Mm -hmm. right? Just from seeing the example of, you know, my parents working and, Mm -hmm. you know, having a certain allowance when I was very young or the fact that, you know, maybe I could do this and that and, you know, do some work and earn additional money, whatever it was. And then, yeah, as time has gone on, I've just learned more, I guess you could say about the, you know, what money is Mm -hmm. um, and the, the banking system and economics. I did study economics in school, which was useful actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to even be in the world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, if you're in it in any sort of serious way and you've really looked into it, then you do end up going down this rabbit hole of like, okay, well, what is money? Mm-hmm. Right? People will yeah. say, oh, Bitcoin is fake yeah. money or Bitcoin has no value or whatever it is. And it's like, okay, well, all right, let's go back to the basics. What is money? What's mm-hmm. the history of it? What are dollars and pounds, mm-hmm. euros? Are they valuable? Why are they valuable? What about mm-hmm. inflation? What about taxes? Right about it's it's a deep rabbit hole and yeah. it covers everything from ethics to politics to morality to history to economics, all of these things. And most people don't think about money that deeply, right? It's just right. if you ask people, most people, what is money? It's like, oh, it's coins and it's notes, or yeah. maybe if they're a bit more sophisticated, they might say, Oh, it's some you know, digits on a screen, and maybe they know a little bit about you no, know, it's made by the Fed. Uh, or, you know, it comes from this treasury or whatever. And from a sort of more philosophical perspective, money is freedom, right? It, mm-hmm. it enables freedom. It also enables you to help a lot of people in various ways, actually. If you have money, if you have wealth, you can't pour from an empty jug. But if yeah. you have resources and additional resources, okay, cool. Like you can do cool things in terms of philanthropy and charity, et cetera. Money is technology. Mm. Money is tech. As technology develops, so does money. Mm. And it's as much about communication, the technology, as it is about the actual money itself. So, for example, um, you know, when, when they invented coins, and we'll discuss early coinage later on, but when they invented coins, that was another great technological evolution that, that's lasted to today. We still use coins. Um uh, the inventing of the printing press meant that we started using paper instead of metal. Mm-hmm. The emergence of digital technology in the 70s, I guess, and 80s meant that money stopped being paper and checks and um, maybe not in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, they no longer use checks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and we started using digital money. Mm-hmm. But also the very first money that was transferred between the United States and England across the um Uh, across the Atlantic Ocean was able to be transferred because of the cable, the the first Mm. transatlantic cable that went through uh, under the ocean. And that's why the currency, the pound and the dollar, by the way, is called cable. That exchange is called cable because of the first transatlantic cable. But that cable through which people were able to communicate meant that money could be sent. As long as I knew the person that was receiving the communication on the other side was good, was reliable, um, uh, was a re- reliable party, which he would have been because it would have been two banks, mm-hmm. possibly even two people who knew each other sending the message. The, the debt was recorded. And so that was how the first money was sent. So money's mu- as much about communication, writing, right. sending the messages across the channel, time stamping it on the blockchain. As It's as much about the developments as communi- in communication as it is about whatever the underlying um, assuming it's a commodity money, whatever, mm. under, you know, whether if it's fiat money, it's backed by the law, if it's commodity, it's backed by commodity, <clears throat> but it's a, but whichever it is, it's the, 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 the exchange of the money depends on communication. And you know, money is just one of those things where people don't talk about it really all that much. Right. right. I mean, most, I mean, and when, when I later became a financial advisor, I sat down with thousands, thousands of families that just blew my mind how, Everybody, everybody is le- leading a life of 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 like this quiet, like desperation, and nobody is willing to talk to one another about it. Right. And it's this weird like thing that that you know we've concocted it up, and they don't teach us about it in schools. And 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 you know ultimately, like when I when I finally grew up, I was just like, wait, so there's this thing that you know that people get into divorces over. There's this thing that people get into world wars over. Yet when I go to anybody, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, my t- 
teachers, anyone. I go to my friends. I go to ask anybody, the financial advisor, who anybody. I go, what is money? And I just shut up. You just go, what is money? And you just let them, like, you know, do their mental gymnastics. To this day, to this day, like, unless they're a Bitcoiner, have I heard someone be like, well, you know, fungibility. And right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> how, how, how is it right. that all of us are like, it's like oxygen. It is the thing that we live on, yet nobody knows what it even is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the most important tool in the world. Nobody knows. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. And, and, you know, I mentioned, I kind of alluded, like when I first got on, got onto the treadmill, if you will, my first couple like jobs, and it wasn't just like a co-op job where you had student loans and daddy's Amex card. And it was like, when you're like, oh, you're on your own now, you're going to do your own thing. It was just like complete and utter confusion. It was just like, I had no clue what was going on. And it, I had asthma and I still have asthma. And, and, and I would say it was, that was the closest feeling to it in the sense that, you know, when you have oxygen, you're good right? No problem. But when you don't, like, you know, when you're underwater right. or when you uh, you have trouble breathing, it's all you can think about. And money is yeah. kind of like that. And it's like, and I went from this like state of like, oh, feeling like I had abundance, I can have water, water to like this part, place where I, I couldn't even like make the numbers work. And, and, and it was almost like the entire thing was like rigged against me. And, and, and it, it felt that way. But again, like, it's so hard if, you, if you're not educated, if you don't, have anyone that's even taught you or whatever it's so hard to articulate so yeah so so you know it was it was really just like a series of stumbling upon trying to answer that question in my adult life that i just felt frustrated and really bitcoin kind of just came out of nowhere money originated everywhere spontaneously mm -hmm. repeatedly um in every society that advanced to become complex and wealthy throughout history um, in fact, it was so ubiquitous and so consistent an invention that it makes sense to say that money is intrinsic to us. Mm -hmm. It's not like the printing press or something where it's an invention with a specific origin. It's intrinsic to us and the way we communicate through the exchange of value uh, as cooperative social animals. Money gets invented uh, and typically it these uh, primitive societies tend to use whatever local materials they can. But over time, there's such, so there's such a thing as good money and bad money and everything in between. And over time, what you find is that good money sticks around, whereas bad money gets kind of outcompeted and uh, demonetized, loses its value. The reason being, it's just this, free market process of trial and error, and it's ultimately people's self-interest. So if money is your store of value and you use better money than someone else, then your value will hold through time. Mm -hmm. You uh, will be able to make long -term, longer term decisions, better decisions over time, pass on wealth to your children. In terms of the other functions, if you have better money, then um, you can trade with more people uh, in terms of a medium of exchange because uh, more people will accept it. The money is almost an extension of the mind in a way. Mm -hmm. it, we're, we're all wiring our minds together through the price signal through money. And then if we, if we consciously corrupt the money, which is effectively what we're doing with central banking, right? We're taking yes. by declaration of fiat, I'm going to overturn what the free market has selected or would select as money and dictate that this fiat currency is money instead of gold or Bitcoin or anything else. Um, we are corrupting that. We're corrupting the, the extension of our mind. And it seems like that reverberates backwards, you know, reflexively into our individual minds. <laughs> And yeah. so this is where you get into all, you know, the fiat food and fiat behavior and fiat business models um, that 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 pervades in the modern age. Well, the, uh, think about it in the in the biology context. If the biological valuation system in the brain is off in one area, that will have a reflexive impact on the other lobes over time. And so when people were talking about the fiat food and, and that kind of stuff, 
it just makes sense that that would be what would come out of a broken monetary valuation system. It totally makes sense that the education system shouldn't cost $200,000 plus to go get a four-year education from you know, a, a majority of classes that you could just learn online for, you know, or on the Sailor Academy for free, right? Like, <laughs> right. like it just kind of, it all starts to really kind of click together and make sense if if you subscribe to the you know this this fundamental idea that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, this is where again the name of the show here is the What Is Money Show because I just it has so many damn answers to that question. What is money? Now, if we call it an extension of our mind or or a reflexive tool for the mind, these other pieces start to click together. It's like yeah. What, why has the world gone so far off the rails the past 50 years? Well, maybe it's because we broke the economic neurotransmitter we call money. Yeah. And we're just lost now. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. I, I think this is why everybody should read Graber's book because I think it does a good job of kind of pointing this out is because it gets back to the, what's the definition of money, mm -hmm. right? Who, who, who defines what money is? Now there's, there, there, there is what you and I, I think if we were left for our own devices, we could probably agree that we should just let the market figure out what money is. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I would probably agree that we could probably narrow it down to two or three things that would become money that we would agree on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then the other side, the other side of the argument, and this is Graeber's argument is, what you and I think is a fantasy because it's never actually been that way. Right. And that what's always actually been money is whatever the state said it was. Right. Yeah. And if the state says it's dollars then it's dollars, and if they say it's copper, then it's copper. And if they say it's tulips, then it's tulips. And you can have these fancy theories and funny stories that you tell yourself, but money is whatever the state says it is. And so from that perspective, I think she's saying, listen, we can issue whatever we whatever money we want. Um, and we can, you know, we can use all our power to enforce yeah. its use, yeah. including violence. You know, I right. think it's a very statist view, right? It's the whole, yes. it, 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 
MMT is the description of the statist view of money. Yes. And I guess you just have to decide for yourself which one is, which one, which one you, then, okay, then this is a, which one you personally like versus which one actually exists. Right. Yeah. So, and I, th I think, I think that's, that's kind of one of the things where I kind of get off base with a lot of, um, either people, um, who don't agree with, with, with my point of view of fiat yeah. currency and gold and Bitcoin and some of these other things, because whereas I'm a fan, quote unquote fan of, of individually chosen forms of money, whether it's gold or Bitcoin or you know, yeah. Ethereum or yeah. whatever it is. Um, I try not to be a fan of any investments because if you're a fan of something, your, your, your judgment is if you eternally passion. clouded. Like I don't trust the Fed. I don't trust the treasury. Yeah. And I, you know, the definition of money is a unit of account, a store of value. And what's that one? Uh, Medium of exchange. Yeah. Exchange ability. Yeah. So the dollar is a declining, it's, it's being depreciated and otherwise being spent or mm. printed out of existence. Or at least Bitcoin, which I don't understand very well, <clears throat> but I know via design is designed to hold its value. Mm -hmm. And so I buy gold, silver, and gold and silver to me are God's money. Mm -hmm. so I've started a gold mine, I've started silver mines. I have millions in gold and silver stored in vaults outside the US. I don't trust my government mm -hmm. for confiscation, as you know. Mm -hmm. But when I looked at Bitcoin, was talking to guys like you and Max Kaiser and stuff like this, I'm going, I got it. It cannot be diluted, mm -hmm. cannot be printed away. And so when I see what Biden is now, what, 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 you know, in 2008, they borrowed 700 billion and now it's 7 trillion. Yeah. God yeah. almighty, you're still yeah. saving money. Right. You're crazy. And more to come. Yeah, it, yeah, it cannot stop. No, it accelerates. Yeah, it, it accelerates yeah, until exactly. it, until the currency breaks down completely. So that's interesting. Right. You you actually look at gold, silver, Bitcoin as an insurance policy, effectively. Correct. A hedge. So you're monitoring your your cash net cash flows are determining whether something's an asset or liability, but you have to actually hedge the cash itself because it's being depreciated by the Fed and Treasury. Correct. And then eventually you get to pretty bad, people start to wake up. And then when you hit very bad, everyone runs. Yeah. And we've seen it in country after country after country where it is hard for people to wrap their head around. Venezuela was the richest country in South America and today is the poorest. Right. That decline took not that long in the arc of history. And so I think that we live a privileged life in the United States where everyone looks at this as a pure financial investment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put 1% of my assets. Mm -hmm. Sure. But those same people are using the stock market as an inflation hedge as well. Right. And one of the best performing stock markets every year for the last couple of years, Venezuela, mm -hmm. Argentina, Right. Zimbabwe. Yeah. The problem is if you buy the stocks, you may not get out. Right. Because literally the currency in which they are denominated in is devaluing at such a rate that you become a billionaire, a trillionaire in the local currency. Yeah. But then the currency collapses and it all goes to zero and you are caught. Yeah. And so if you play stupid games, you get stupid prizes. And that's where I think folks have to be very, very careful and understand asking the question, how does money work? What is money, right? right. To the name of your show. Yeah. That is the single most important question in the world today. And if you have the personal curiosity, you're likely to figure it out. If not, you have to wait till the pain is bad enough to where you feel like you have no other choice. You've lost all hope. You can't get ahead. Yeah. And then you can go look. But we have lesson after lesson after lesson in recent history of don't wait. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think um, there's a mark there of intelligence, right? To learn from the lessons of history or through the pain of others so that you don't have to experience it directly. And, you know, one parallel between energy and currency that maybe uh, viewers will appreciate is they're both fundamentals. So they're both at the, the base of things. So you can think yes. of like finance and, 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 and energy as the two fundamental industries. So yeah. energy is the industry that powers every other industry because yeah. every industry uses machines. And energy is what powers the machines, including the machines that all the hundreds and thousands of machines that produce every machine. So like you you play with the cost, if you make energy more cost effective, so it's lower cost, more reliable, more versatile, larger scale, like you make everything more productive right. and thus affordable for everybody and more people have more capabilities. And if you make energy less cost effective, so it gets more expensive, less reliable, less versatile, short, a smaller scale, then everything gets worse. And so right. it has that like fundamental uh, character and, and, and money, it has this in a bunch of ways. Like it has it in the context of investment, like where money goes, like if money goes, you know, really resources go to their most productive use, that obviously has huge, it has benefits to the extent that happens and to the extent it goes to destruction, you could destroy a whole society uh, right. in a generation if you, if you misallocated capital so much. So it's, it's, yes. you know, I'm very, and so those are, you know, those are realms in which, particularly money, it's totally taken for granted the government should control it. But the more fundamental the realm, the more you should be afraid of coercion deciding things because there's no way that, that you know, it can be decided rationally if yes. it's one coercive person. And the other realm I would just add to this is ideas. Mm -hmm. It's very much taken for granted that, as I mentioned before, it's a good thing for the government to control education. It's usually put as, oh, we're going to be generous. But of course, it's yeah. just taking people's money, but we're going to be course. generous with this. Like, oh, we're going to fund all this great school and all these great science uh, research. And, and isn't that fantastic? But it really just means we're going to control it. And so you really are having people with guns controlling what research gets right. done, what research doesn't get done, what gets taught. So it's, it's this unbelievable lever that yeah. I don't think, you know, our founding fathers could have ever imagined that degree of control where, again, some people who wanted a way to attack capitalism after the Vietnam War, like in my view, brainwashed almost everyone right. through this allegedly beneficent mecha uh, mechanism of free school and free science. I think it's so important, and I try to go over it constantly in my videos, that dollars in and of themselves are, are not wealth. They have they have nothing to do with wealth. And I would, and I would, you know, to piss off a lot of people, I would go so far as say even Bitcoin and gold, S throw silver in there. That in and of itself is not wealth. What mm. wealth is at the end of the day is the ability, a society's ability to produce goods and services, mm -hmm. period, period. That's it. And uh, I, I think, and I'm not saying Bitcoin's bad, or I'm not saying Bitcoin mm -hmm. or gold or silver are bad. You know, I'm, I'm fans of all, all three of those things. But at the end of the day, that, that's what wealth is. It, it's, 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 it's not money, believe it or not. Money, in my opinion, is just a, a way to store your excess productivity. Uh -huh. So hopefully we're a society of individuals that are producing more than we consume. Right. And that's how you get wealthy. And, and the money, whether it's Bitcoin, gold or silver, is just a way to store your excess productivity. Right. Yes. Unfortunately, right now at the United States and what we've been doing since <laughs> for a long, long time, you know, going back to the uh, I was going to say the 70s, but maybe the, the 60s. I, I need to look at the deficits back then. Well, probably actually going back to Bretton Woods. Mm hmm. Um, you know, we have consumed much more than we produce by design. And, it, yeah. and at the end of the day, that that is unsustainable. You yeah. can't it's just like a, a very simple econ. It's like being a farmer, you yeah. know, going back 500 years or whatever. You, you can't consume more than you produce. You right. have to produce at least as much as you consume or you're going to starve. It's like um, there's a famous example in a POW camp in World War II, cigarettes became the currency. Mm -hmm. So even non-smokers would give up, you know, if you had an extra ration of ham and you didn't like it, you would yeah. sell it for some cigarettes, even if you weren't a smoker. Right. Because there were enough smokers who really wanted cigarettes that you could get whatever you yes. needed if you had cigarettes. Yeah. Right. So that was 
that was Menger's insight. Um, and that's where, that's where money came from. But yeah, once one or two commodities were accepted, you know, that process would snowball. And then yes. once a few commodities were just accepted by just about everybody, that's what money is. I don't know to what extent animal psychologists have looked into like, do chimps or beavers or, uh, you know, other animals have a kind of intuitive, like sense of property rights, mm -hmm. but I would be really surprised if they didn't. And I think you're right that, that money is sort of the, uh, an abstraction of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I just think of money as like money is liquid fitness. Mm. Right? Money is money is something that you can trade for any other form <laughs> of fitness that might be useful to you, whether it's food or territories or mates or <laughs> childcare or protection or, you know, a so better social network or whatever. There's this deep relationship between money and time. Um, and but hence you, the reason to, or the, the incentive to try to control either. This is also why usury was con considered such a condemnable thing, right? Is because if money is a reflection, if, if money is stored time, not even just mm -hmm. stored value, but just stored time, like a laborer's time mm -hmm. in a physical form that they can then redeem, right? Mm -hmm. Like if that's what the purpose of money was from an ethical, at the ethical level, then to profit off of it without investing any time would obviously be corrupt, right? right? So now it's like when we look at, when we, when we go back to the issue of capitalism, it's like, obviously, I think capitalism is good and has many positive things, but I think it, you'd have to be blind to ignore some of the negative things, which is like, you know, this whole number go up mentality is like, what can I buy where number go up and I don't actually have to invest any time in it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that would be, I'm not necessarily condemning people for doing that because it's in their best interest, mm -hmm. but it just shows like the degradation of societal values. It's like, all of the tools that we have to make money that require you invest time in them are bad. They're not in your interest. Like it is, it's, it's good for you to invest in things that don't require your time. And there's so many options like that available, but it is a bit, it feels a bit dirty. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I my, to just capture value in that way. Yeah. To capture you know, a call option on time when you're not investing any time, right? There's, there seems to be something asymmetric there. Here's an interesting thing, because it's both the physical technology and the psycho technology. Same time, you've got mobile armies and trying to finance them to direct, right? Barter is like, ah, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. They invent money. Right. And the money is invented for mobile armies, mm -hmm. right? Coinage. And so coinage and you are talking about it. It's, you know, it's this massive, you know, power, mm -hmm. right. And, and for all the reasons you've articulated, but it's also a second technology mm. because coinage makes you think in terms of an abstract symbol system and it makes you do arithmetic and calculate about it. Yes. That isn't natural before coinage to everybody. Right, right, right. Yes. And the, the economists would say, uh, Austin's least economic calculation is made possible through coinage or money. And that's, yeah. so when you're, you know, what am I going to do today? You're planning a vacation or you're running a business. Like you're think this language of accounting, if you will, it's yes. made possible through the standardization of coins or money. And then, and, and, the, and there's other things like, you know, the Venetians invent double entry, uh, account keeping yes. and they, they get a huge economic advantage, right? Yes. Or you get, you know, Descartes invents Cartesian graphing and science, right? Takes, right? Psychotechnologies are tremendous and they, and they transform us way beyond their original intent. Yes. Way yes. beyond their original intent. So I Even, think it's. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, sorry, I was just going to add mathematics. I mean, even more fundamentally, right? It's, um, I, I wrote. Some about the Hindu Hindu Arabic numeral system. When numerals, we discovered, yes, when we discovered yes, the number yes. zero, it just swept the world. You know, yes, we, yes. Try, try doing math with Roman numerals. Right. Try yeah. It. It's terrible. The risk yeah. With, yeah. yeah. So, oh boy. Yeah. So that's the power of psychotechnology. Now, the thing about money is it's really interesting, right? It's it's like literacy in the way it links us together, mm -hmm. and we can also and it, 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 it internalizes new ways of thinking mm -hmm. fundamentally. But, it, it, but like you said, it's also something out there, mm -hmm. right, that belongs to 
like belongs to distributed cloud. I, I on my own cannot make money. That doesn't make any sense. I'm right. on a, I'm on a right. desert island. Here's my money. Yes. Who the heck care? Like there's no money. <laughs> yeah. right? the, the, like, m- m- like, you know, the, 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 the pieces of paper other than their m- museum value from the American Confederacy are not money, right. right? They're historical artifacts and that's, but they're not money, right? Yes. And so I'm interested in like what you're talking about. And I, what I'm doing is giving you a buttressing argument that money is a psychotechnology, but it seems to also be doing this other thing, which I suggested to you earlier, if I'm, if I'm understanding you, it seems to be mediating between individual and distributed cognition in some important way. Yes, yes, yeah. It's a great way to look at it. Um, I would say that as, in terms of, you mentioned a tool is something that uh, facilitates our fitness to the world in some specific yeah, yeah. way, right? It us. Yeah, it fits yeah. us. It fits us better to the world. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would say that money. I'm just thinking out loud that it it we could consider it a tool for trading our time in a very mm-hmm. basic sense. It's like you you go to work, you sacrifice your time for money in exchange for money. You then carry that money with the expectation that you can redeem it for similar sacrifices from others, right? Yes, I can then yeah. take that money to the restaurant and they'll give me food or service or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's, so the optimal money then, if, if, if money is a store house or a reservoir of time, or I guess you could say energy too, in a way, it's like you've expended yes. energy, you're going to redeem energy. The ideal money would be as irreproducible as your time. Right. Mm. So, so it should map on to the nature of time and energy um, in a thermodynamic sense, right? That, you know, second, yeah, yeah. second law of thermodynamics cannot create or destroy energy. Um, and that's another, that's, you know, why Bitcoin is saying Bitcoin is such a breakthrough. It's the first asset we have that cannot be reproduced in any way. Even gold inflates a little bit every year. You know, there's 2% more gold every year. But with right, Bitcoin, right. you know with perfect certainty how much there will ever be. So it's an absolutely fixed supply. Because this is what money does. Money tends to take apples and oranges mm-hmm. and puts them into a unit of currency. Yeah. So you can compare everything. That's why money is so much better than so many other things because of its fungibility. It is the thing that equalizes you know, that, that house in, uh, in London. Yeah. versus the much bigger house in North Dakota. How am I going to know whether the bigness of the house in North Dakota is enough to compensate for its location? I'm going to look right. at something like the price. You need a universal language like mathematics too. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, Day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, Just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove let's just jump in the deep end what is money to you santiago (laughs) like the most convenient and beautiful lie we could ever tell each other that's how i would phrase it (laughs) um 
money, I think, is just a, a super interesting social contract. It's like a abstraction that uh, just facilitates so many things for us, makes life mm. efficient. Um, and it does mean purchasing power, which is kind of one of the things that I've taken from so many of your talks. Um, and I think it's a, uh, a huge responsibility for who the caretaker of that, uh, of, of money is in a society. Uh, and I think that it's one of the things that's been abused um, in, in that, uh, that role. Uh, so to me, listening to a lot of your interviews, um, what's become apparent is how desperate we are in need of a better lie, if you will, a better abstraction right. um, to, uh, to a more responsible one and one that uh, creates more opportunity. So that, that's money for me. And, and honestly, I, um, I didn't have a sense of money until my early 40s. Um, I, had, uh, I thought of money as something to just go and make so yeah. that I could buy stuff uh, and maybe retire with. Uh, but it was a very uh, superficial understanding of it. And I think um, I would call it value. And I, I, for me, value is something that was denied me uh, as a child. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily maliciously, but just you grow up in a society and you're conditioned to express value in a certain way. Um, and you take it for granted as something that's always been true, always existed, and there is no alternative. Uh, but I, my eyes are, are open. Uh, so sorry for the long expression, but that, no. that's how I see it. No, that's great. That's great. That's, um, you know, the idea of money. I, I like how you put that actually as a, as a lie, right? Because it is, it's a useful fiction. Um, and at the surface level, this may sound like something that's bad in some way but indeed um as i've touched on a few times in the show that our ability to construct these useful fictions and organize ourselves within them is what makes it's what separates human from animal and what makes human or homo, homo sapien if you will dominant in the world and you know i say sapien specifically because that's actually <laughs> the thesis of the book sapiens by yuval harari it's like we can cooperate flexibly in large numbers the way no other species can through this telling and believing of stories or useful fictions. And that's why we, we run the world, right? We're at the top of the food chain for that very reason. I know plenty of people that have made money that you would think is silly, right? Like the amount of money that no one person should have. And I know plenty of people that have that they've made it within the last 24 months. And they're no happier than they were 24 months ago. A lot of them are much more miserable. Yeah. And the problem is if you make money your goal, that same reality that you described of like, what if money wasn't an object, what would I do? Right. Most people, I would say the first time you do that exercise, it's a, it's a difficult one mm -hmm. because yeah, what's the point? because our entire life has been programmed around success means making money means having nice things means you know everyone thinks that you are so yeah. la di da and all of a sudden if you shatter that that narrative that you've been pitched it's uh it's a different world yeah Definitely. yeah no it's it reminds me steve jobs quote on money you know, something to the effect where he was determined to not let the money destroy him. You know, he was worth, I don't know, a hundred million dollars at 24, 25 years old. Yeah. But he had prior to that made a commitment. Like when he was on the rocket ship, he's like, I cannot let the money destroy me. And I think yeah. it's really important to go through this with yourself, whether mm -hmm. you're trying to get rich or not, like to just be in the mindset of what you would do in that situation mm -hmm. will help you put down really solid philosophical anchors i guess so you know what to do it should you end up in that situation yeah and um it's because it really can you know money is power and if you just get a huge concentration of it and you don't know there's no mission in your life or there's no meaning or there's no direction then it can very well destroy you you know it's again mm -hmm. absolute power corrupts absolutely if you have yeah. that much power it can mess you up
money is language. Mm -hmm. Money is defined by uh, words and money has meaning uh, out there in the world. But for me and for us, uh, money is related to the language we're using about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Conversations with ourselves, conversations with each other about uh, what it is, how we use it, uh, what it means, especially from our past. We're human beings and humans are, are historical beings. And so our past and our relationship to what has happened with money in the past may very well be our future, mm -hmm. especially if we don't consider the language that we're using uh, around, around that, that topic. So really what, what I'd like to offer is that we create a future in relationship to money in terms of the language that we use. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I like, you know, it's been called the language of value by a lot of great thinkers. Um, and I've explored a bit of this in my writing with this connection between the logos, um, which is a very ancient idea. You know, if you translate the logos from Greek, it means word or ratio. So the connection I was trying to tease out were in words, like typically they have meaning relative to each other, right? It's the context and the grammar in which we're using these tools, these psychotechnologies to communicate. Um, but with money, its main feature, I guess, is the communication of prices. And prices are well, those two, in the same way that words have a ratio of meaning, prices are just conveying an exchange ratio, basically, denominated in this universal language of money. And then I, I think you, you've actually taken it a step further when you're saying the conversations are also with ourselves, um, which is true because we're planning in money, we're thinking in money, we're, you know, there's, it's it's like a mental software we're using to deal with the world in many ways. So money is, isn't this thing that comes to us naturally. Um, it's, it serves a purpose. It has a function and something then is money to the extent that it does what money is supposed to do. Um, for a long time, people, I think, seem to think that money was supposed to be valuable. Now we're kind of getting, uh, to the idea that the commodity money was kind of a bad idea mm -hmm. and any non-monetary properties that a thing has takes away from its ability to do some of these other things. Mm -hmm. To what extent does, let's say, Bitcoin fill key money roles? Well, if you ask that question in 2007, um, people are going to say, what is Bitcoin? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask it in 2010, um, they're going to say, terribly, nobody's ever bought anything with it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you ask it in 2013, okay, some people have bought some pizzas with it, but that's about it. So Bitcoin is coming to fill these key money roles um, more and more over time. And so it's a mistake to just take a snapshot of it at a time and say, to what extent is it doing this? Um, better, I think, to think, to what extent could it do this? Um, suppose, you know, what would it take for Bitcoin to actually do this? Um, how far out of the realm of possibility is it? Does Bitcoin have the intrinsic features that are necessary for it to be able to do this? And then we have this normative or ethical or moral question. Um, suppose that Bitcoin could, um, would it be good for it to do so? So you get a lot of, of uh, anti-Bitcoin people or Bitcoin skeptics who don't think Bitcoin can fill these key money roles. They think it's ill-suited um, based on its features. Then you have some people who think that it can, and that's scary for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they think, uh, wow, B Bitcoin could really take over. And that would not um, lead to what I think the best vision of the world would be. Mm -hmm. And so there's like these two camps, the one that's just arguing that Bitcoin it, you know, isn't a useful money. And then the other kind that's saying, oh my gosh, Bitcoin um, could be so popular of a money that it could destroy um, all these things that I think are valuable. And so two different lines of argument against Bitcoin, one's more practical and one's more ethical, moral, theoretical. Yeah, I think that you do a great job of 
sort of circumscribing the Bitcoin rabbit hole here. It's like, <laughs> could, could this thing be money? If so, what are the implications of that? And I appreciate the functional question because that it ultimately is just a matter of fitness, right? If a tree stump, if you can put your ass on a tree stump, then it's a chair, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's serving a, a, a purpose or, or the doorstop as you described. And again, where that takes you right back to what is it that humans demand in money or from money or desire in money? And I think that, I mean, so far as my explorations have taken me, that really is the first principle of money. Ultimately, it's like what, what functional fitness quality or value are humans demanding from this technology or social institution, psychotechnology? <laughs> Money's kind of a lot of these different things, you know, it's yeah. part technology, part psychotechnology, part social institution. Um, and it really, you know, to your point, you can't take the snapshot in time because it's not, it's ignoring the, again, if we're talking about fitness, it's ignoring the evolutionary track of money, right? It's like, how could mm -hmm. these properties, how suitable are they as money? I guess in the, in the long run, the infamous long run, as economists talk about. So it really comes down to how we define money. Because like, if we looked at Bitcoin in 2010 and said, oh, nobody uses it as a medium of exchange, it's garbage, it's not money. But that would ignore the, the, monetization process itself, actually, that we observed with gold, at least anecdotally, um, and what Bitcoin's going through now. It's just something we've never actually seen. You know, we have we have somewhat of a historical allegory in gold, I guess, but it's a much longer, more murky, complicated path of monetization, whereas Bitcoin's clearly happening really fast. Mm. I do have a passage and a take on what is money that like has really sticks with me that I want to share. Please. And it's from um, the dying of money. I'm not going to read the whole thing out loud, but um, he says that essentially he says that money is the, it's the counterweight to all things of value. And that in that money is actually the opposite of value. Money has no value. It's an, it, I like the idea that it's an anti-value, but it is merely a reflection of the economy that the money serves. Mm. And so the, any currency is essentially, it's backed by the world's economy. That's what backs all money is the real number of saleable values, products and services in the economy. And that doesn't matter whether money is gold, or paper or computer credits or Bitcoin. Money is the most valueless thing. Um, Eric Vosco makes the point that like the concept of store of value is not an inherent property of anything, anything whatsoever. When he made that point, I was like, oh God, I hadn't thought about it that way. You kind of think, well, gold has, gold has store of value properties. No, no, nothing has store of value properties. Regardless, we will, now that we have money as a civilization, we will always have money. I'm not saying that money is pointless or that money is an illusion. But in the way that we use it, it has almost an anti-value. It's just, it's, it's just a share in the economy that the money serves. And then when you dilute the money, you dilute all the shares. No, it's, it's a great unique way to look at it um especially throwing that first function on its head in a way right it's like to to store value it's not that it's a reflection of the actual valuable goods and services in an economy this yeah. gets back to a point that jeff snyder shared on this show which is that he, he was advocating that money is not wealth right wealth is the productive factors in an economy and then money is effectively a call option on those productive factors um it it's also been said that you know money is the most beautiful or useful lie ever told <laughs> something like that money is an accepted mean means of exchange as it's nothing in itself it's based on 
trust and uh, willingness to agree to let this particular means of exchange be used in some community. There was a time when it was theoretically backed by some fixed uh, commodity, usually gold. But that again is based on trust. Why should anybody care about that particular mineral? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a convention that says, let's accept this as the means of exchange. By now, most money is just something going on in the uh, uh, inter, inter, on the you know the uh, electronic uh, media. It's not a medium at all.